So absolutely amazing. Everyone's guidance has, has really brought me to this point today. And so this is the end of my, uh, my presentation today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll start with the committee members with your questions, and now we can then. Okay. <coughs> Very interesting presentation. I understand that I arrived almost in time. I'm terribly sorry. But my delay was really unintentional. Um, it's solid, nice, interesting presentation and uh, solid, interesting research. There are two or three points that I want to think with you a bit. One of them is uh, in, if you can go to the 22, to the page 22, or the, uh, the, the 22. That is the damn if you do and damn if you don't of mm -hmm. this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the effect of demanding return, maybe uh, losing of voice and losing of uh, project to the future. The, uh, uh, the opposite position, namely that you cannot return, you should stay, uh, creates an instruction of like, cutting the past. Who is... Uh, you, you mentioned these two positions as official positions. In your view, the IDPs perceive the done if you do and done if you don't, the double bind of that situation? Or uh, is it something that you infer from other... But, uh, no, actually, the, the IDPs are, are reading the position of the officials quite correctly. They are reading the position of the, of the official correctly, and they do think that if the official thinks that I should return, then, then they, they, they don't feel empowered. They don't feel that, that they have the right to, to get the 100% rehabilitation that they would have gotten. Because if it is a temporary disturbance and you are to go back, as the policymaker is telling them to go back, that means that they, that they will never get the 100% rehabilitation. So, so they think that it's a, it's a loose thing. It's, it's not a win-win situation for them. Same way, there is no winning in this thing. Same way, if the policy makers that you move because of own volition, you, were mi you migrated, that means you lose the right to return. So, so they also sense that. And if you lose the right to return, then, then you, need, you need the 100% rehabilitation in your new town. So this is, uh, I think the IDPs are, are reading the, the officials correctly, because the officials themselves are saying that we don't have a roadmap for return. And what I'm thinking from the, from the view of the IDPs is, is the officials, instead of confronting the opposition in, in Kashmir, instead of making reconciliation and, and, and facing the opposition, they just keep the displaced in, 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 in a cognitive dissonance kind of uh, frame. And so I think they, they do it on purpose, because uh, they, they want to keep them confused as long as they can, uh, from not having to make the policies uh, one way or another. Yeah, but uh, again, the question is, if they would say, you have to return, what would happen? If, let's say, they enforce that, or they enforce the other, what would happen? To the community in general? I think from my, from my interviews, only 7% of the people indicate a solid desire to return. Because they're saying the community is broken, the community is dead, and the seeds of mistrust have been sown. They will not be able to trust their Muslim neighbors again, they're saying. So 90% so have sold their house. That indicates that you don't have an interest in the future of Kashmir. If you don't uh, participate in the elections, that means you don't care what happens to Kashmir. So, so even if the government sets a roadmap and say, everybody who came has to return, I don't think the people will return. So it is in the best interest of the uh, IDPs. Uh, IDPs to 
stay and be recognized and be exactly. rehabilitated. As exactly, you say. exactly. <clears throat> okay, and the, the next question in all that is, is there a, a militancy in that direction that goes anywhere or they are immobilized? Well, there is militancy uh, right now and there are 400,000 uh, Indian Army security forces still deployed in the Kashmir Valley. The government of Jammu and Kashmir, they had created 3,000 positions for people to come back and provide them with jobs. They have the employment. But the thing is the return is always linked to employment and not to security, not to safety. So there is militancy and, and that is the reason the government doesn't, uh, doesn't confront the people. Uh, so return is, is more than the issue of just going back to your home. It is economics, it is politics, it is so many things. And, and sometimes you send the people back to a place that is more dangerous. They end up dying. So, so I think even if you do a road map of return, uh, it's very unlikely because my, my, my data release that 7% seven, 7 of the people have indicated a solid desire to return. They say, well, they want to die in their homeland. Uh, but the rest, they have sold their property. That means they don't, uh, they, they're not interested. I still have one other question, if I may. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think I just show case and he will research even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, has to have to do with your point that the older generation keeps youth from returning, <laughs> which is a it's a strange formulation <laughs> in, in my in my view, in the sense that uh, the. Young generation, if they uh, they already were grown up in this new environment, they don't have either. They had an extremely idealized wish, uh, uh, view of Idea. the, of mm -hmm. the of Kashmir, mm -hmm. and saying we should go back and fight for our right. Or the opposite. I feel member of this this country, this new community, and, and so they move according to these two possible positions, you know, not necessarily following and sometimes going against the parents. That is true, that I, is true. You know, so uh, the, it is not the old generation that keeps youth from returning, but it is a much more complex set of variables much more complex set of variables and I think the economic opportunities also play a role uh, in addition to the stories that people have heard from their relatives. Mm -hmm. I asked one person, I said, would you like to go back to Kashmir? And he said, no, no, never. So I said, so you were in Kashmir before? He said, no, I've never been to Kashmir, but my auntie told me that, uh, you know, we, we should not, uh, we don't belong there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, um, so yes, is, is uh, I, uh, maybe uh, I have to qualify that statement that is not 100% of the time. Uh, so we are looking at, it, at protracted displacement and people have been exposed to, to new environment. And that is a factor, absolutely. That is a factor. So mm -hmm. I, I can qualify that uh, uh, finding. Thank you. Oh, do you have any questions? Do you want to verify this mobility of the mobilization question? Do you want to verify this mobilization question, the question number two, do you, do you want to verify it? Verify it? Yeah. To get more information on mobilization. Oh, no, 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 I'm just uh, okay. I'm satisfied with the conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Dr. Abu. So Sinha, I'd like to congratulate you on You may be the first of your cohort. No? <laughs> um, you were... Uh, incredibly well well organized and I have never seen a more dogged student at getting people to talk to her <laughs> including people in very high offices and if Professor Slusky is to thank for that then absolutely to, thank you thank you so much off to, uh, thank you. Carlos also um, so I, I I think that some of your findings are very interesting uh, the generational one, which also I have some questions about, because it seems counter counterintuitive. But I really especially like 
the finding that so often IDPs are treated as subjects, subject to authority, mm -hmm. subject to events, subject to things completely out of their control. And yet when you talk about the IDPs really reading the, the ambiguous and contradictory rhetoric of the authorities and using that as leverage against the authorities, I think it shows the IDPs as being a agentic, as being agents in a way that very, very often uh, other studies don't. They treat them as, mm -hmm. as victims and as subjects. So that, that's something that I think probably deserves an article in and of okay. itself as you come out of the, out of the larger work. Um, let me, I, I have a few questions. Let me just continue for a moment on the generational uh, track that, that Carlos started. Um, if you or someone else were to go back to the third generation, the grandchildren of some of the elders, do you still think it would make sense to speak of that group as IDP? Words, at, at, one point, at what point does the very identity of IDP, if, if ever, get lost or get so weakened that mm -hmm. it's, you know, someone claiming they're related to a Cherokee princess? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. And I think it has to do with how the international community, basically the United Nations, defines IDPs and where does it end? Where do you end becoming an IDP? That is, that is what you are asking, mm -hmm. absolutely. And uh, it depends how you define your homeland. What is your homeland? Is it the home of your ancestors, Kashmir Valley, where auntie and uncle grew up? Or is it where you, you were born? You could have been born in a camp. Is that your new home? So I think we have to go back to the definition of home in that situation. And, and we, I mean, we have to go back to United Nations, mm -hmm. of course, but we have to go back to the definition of home. And your answer, the, the question that you have, I think we have to define what is home. And, and when does it stop becoming your home? Is Kashmir Valley still my home, which was burned down? So this is, this is a larger discussion, and uh, it's and, intriguing. And, and that actually leads me to my second question. You talk about being born in a camp. So one of the strengths of your research is that you, you looked at IDPs in Delhi. Yes. And IDPs in Jammu. Jam, yes. And you talked about some of the differences. Yes. My, my first inclination would be to say, I would rather be an IDP in Jammu because I'd be surrounded by people culturally closer to me than to be in such a diverse metropolis as Delhi. And yet, as I read your description, I changed my mind. I thought if I had to be an IDP, I would rather be in Delhi mm -hmm. than in Jammu, much closer to my home. Mm -hmm. Do you share that? I share it. Why? I, I share it because why did people go to Jammu? They went to Jammu because it was closer. And they were told that this is a temporary chaos. So it makes it easy for you to return from 280 kilometers as opposed to 800 kilometers. And people did not have a lot of money to travel that distance. So people chose to stay in Jammu. What has happened in Jammu? The policy that have, that have, that would meant to protect these IDPs have actually separated them from the larger community. We have settlements, uh, seven-story apartment building to house the IDPs. 2,500 IDPs stay in one building where I also shared a place with the, with the host fam the IDP family. What it has done? It has isolated them. It has, it has not only kept them away from intermingling with the, with the they have no desire. Because, because their group provides them with the, with the belonging and, and the, the recognition. So they don't travel to Jammu. I asked them, how, how will I get to the commissioner's office? They said, we don't know. We, we have never taken a bus. So uh, whereas in, in, in Delhi, they are spread all over the place. Where you have opportunity to interact with the society, where you have been given, the chances are 
that that you will take that opportunity and and you will eliminate the stereotypes but now in, in jammu we we have a stronger parallel society of the of the these kashmiri pandits who came from jammu and the local dogras who who stay there so they look at them as i was really surprised that they look at them as people who are diluting their culture and i'm saying that they're all indian hindus who is diluting this culture don't understand is only when people told me that oh, because intermixed marriages and there are so many things culture of corruption people are double dipping into compensation and our society was not like this before and so on so i'm thinking that even within jammu where they are staying with 2500 people they still are isolated because they are in apartments so uh, so uh, what you are saying is that yes in delhi culture is different but they have acquired a little different identity by 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 doing what they thought is best for this society going to the kind of schools that the host family goes to and so they they feel that they are better off although they are removed thousands of kilometers from the culture but uh, but it has uh, exposed them to different things so i would have uh, hypothesized in answer to my previous question that the idp identity generations down is likely to have faded in delhi long before it fades i believe so i believe so yeah. yes it's it's going to happen it's going to happen and you know that's why the people are saying that the intercaste marriages are causing a problem this this was, was to my surprise people are saying this is most problematic thing that has happened ever since the jammu people the kashmiri people came because uh, and the and the kashmiri people they are feeling the same thing that because when you have a small community you you want to maintain the cohesiveness and you you want to do everything and they think of intercaste marriages as an bringing extinction of this little community so it's a threat it's a threat so both communities are feel, feeling that uh, this is this is not right yes People actually, have, uh, actually that, that was my last question it brings out the anthropologist in me 100% which is when you talked about the, the intercaste marriages which is more of a problem in delhi i presume or in jammu they're they're more isolated in jammu and then my question is really an empirical one are these inner caste marriages or inner jati marriages there more or less sideways up down how are they marrying how are the pandits they they marrying? are marrying uh, down yeah. they are marrying down which must and be particular that's why upsetting. that's why it is so problematic for the kashmiri civan that why should we are pandit and why should my son find that find someone from the local community i mean we we are the top most hierarchy yeah, so i I'd like to remind the non indians that the word pundit comes from pandit so these are people who think a lot knowledge wisdom yes they that the top most uh, hierarchy so yes they they're marrying down and that that's what's troubling and that and uh, that again and you did mention it and and it's part of i think the very comprehensive work you you've done but that's something in particular if you're going to um uh zero down on social identity issues in hindu india it's hard to imagine a more uh, important core than inter jati inter inter caste marriages, marriages yes yeah. mhm mm mhm mm this 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 uh, issue grabbed me yeah. uh grabbed me me yeah. too that yeah. okay um thank you professor abro group of question and they were related not surprisingly to identity issues and um i will start with your own personal identity because you also related to the culture what challenges did you uh, see did you found for yourself as being from embedded in this culture and how did you overcome this challenge because you probably had some biases something well um well knowing the culture and the values of these people that i was going to interview i knew that i am dealing with a society that is very proud of their identity so i knew knowing my culture that what displacement might have done to this society so when i approach these people i was kind of aware of the sensitivities that these people it is possible that these people will shun me out of my interview process they they shut their door on me as, as some some day and uh, so uh, but knowing the culture of the place and knowing where i fit in i was able to i was able to uh, understand their situation a little bit better uh, and, and this cultural sensitivity not only helped me to deal with the idps and the host but the officials too because i know the culture of these people 
I know that if they ask me to come at 8 o'clock first thing in the morning, they probably won't show up all day because they're doing a ribbon cutting ceremony. And I'm waiting. So I understand the culture. And my identity uh, was, uh, I can say, a comparative advantage because I understood when people shut their door on me and they shout at me for why coming here, you know, what, what are you going to ask me? Uh, nobody has come to ask me anything. Nobody cares. Why, why are you here? I understood. I understood because I understand the culture of this community to be a very proud, paternalistic community, academic excellence and so on. So my culture really helped me. That was my advantage yeah. there. But if you speak about challenges, did you find that you feel more emphasis for one group and less to another one? And you had some biases which we were putting you before? Well, I did start my study with a bias. Uh, with a bias that uh, this community has suffered in the hands of militancy and this community um, quarter of a million people this is how i started my research and this was my bias that this community was uh, uh, was culturally deprived and and uh, and there was uh, evicted and so this is how i started but because i did an exploratory study i was willing to challenge my assumption and i said well this is open I, I will talk to the office, of, official and I will talk to the family and I will uh, uh, do the linking with the subjective data that I found in the policy documents with what people are telling me. So I wanted to link. And this was, this was it because I began like that. And, and yes, I had a lot of challenges. My challenge was in, in working with the bereaving families. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I really wanted to side with them when they talk uh, of the officials down the, they haven't done anything, the government, you know. They, they do, I wanted to say, yeah, I know, I understand, but no. So, so I knew that, and this was my challenge, don't play the counselor. That, that's, I was tempted, because I, I wanted to indicate that I understand their situation, but we have to move along my questionnaire. So this was my challenge, because the, the families, they can take one and a half hour, because they invite you to, to their home. They open the fan for you, and, and they bring a glass of water for you, and they think that you will be there uh, for dinner. So this is a challenge to, to, uh, to uh, and that's where the semi-structured interviews helped me because they kept me on track. Even the officials who say, ma'am, uh, it's not worth your time to explore the issues of Kashmir because everything has been resolved. So it's not worth your time. Everything is settled. So even they, they dismiss the question, but you have to bring them back on track. And this was my challenge in dealing with the people, but, but because I know the culture of the officials as well as the people who are suffering, I was able to negotiate and handle, and I was able to handle rejection. I was expecting rejection from many, but I knew how to handle it. Oh, thank you. Uh, my second question concerns relative deprivation, which you put one of the major leading theories in your analysis. Yes. And you, in your presentation today, you covered the relative deprivation based on intergroup comparison. But what about this temporal relative deprivation? Because it directly connects with the questions which were asked by other two members of the committee. How temporal deprivation, relative deprivation, works for different generations? Do you think it's for like third generation, it's less important, or because you believe that there are very cultural, strong cultural influence of older generations and the younger ones, they still experience temporal deprivation with their, with their community? Well, I think as the families told me that the seeds of mistrust had been sown and that will make it hard for them to return. So I think when the seeds have been sown, they are not only going to impact the people who are affected by the situation, but many generations. And this relative deprivation will occur probably a few generations down. Even the, even the people who are studying Kashmir studies that they are in the University of Delhi, even they are saying that I don't really have a desire to go to Kashmir. Neither does my son. We don't speak the language. There's nothing for us. We have made a home here. So, so, uh, so this thing will, will stay with them. And, and they feel uh, that it's going to affect them. So they are social comparisons. They, they don't feel that they belong there anymore. So, uh, so this, this thing is going to pass on. Um, for some time, for some time. Okay, thank you. And my last question is, um, you told that you compared uh, impact of uh, policy assessment of other perceptions, how people see community, how they see themselves. 
Uh, what did you find the most interesting? And I also know that you will compare in not only policy assessment, but also uh, desire to return is one of the factors which can impact perception of the whole situation. What do you find the most important factors? Policy assessment or their desire to return? What was the most influential how they see situation? Policy assessment is very interesting for this community. Even if you assess policies as beneficial, which some communities did, I wanted to go a step further to see what else are they saying for my other questions on their return. How does that assessment of policy become a contributing factor to something down the line, for example, their social dynamic? What I found is that the people who assess the policies as beneficial, let's take one policy, salary protection of the people. The people who were displaced, the government had protected. If they were doing a government job, when they were displaced, the government, Indian government, protected their salary. What this policy, and so they evaluate the policies as beneficial. They think that policies are beneficial. When I look at how they interact with the host community, these same people, this cluster of people, I have formed five clusters of the, of the people who have uh, assess policies one way. So I have a complete profile of what you think about other dimensions of, of displacement. When I look at this cluster of people who evaluated policies as beneficial, what it does when you evaluate policy as beneficial, it, uh, it, releases, uh, it releases your time. For example, the protection from salary. What it has done, it has it has uh, given you more time to interact with the community. They don't have to look for a job because if your salary is protected, you have more time to, to make connections, to, to interact. So their social dynamic has been impacted by the evaluation of policies and vice versa. When people are interacting uh, well, they, they develop a mind frame and they come to develop a mind frame that also makes you assess policies as beneficial. So, so there is a bilateral a correlation that I have found in my study that uh, uh, assessing of policies as beneficial, if you are given opportunity, now I qualify that statement, if you have the opportunity, that means if you are in the embedded society with the host and IDP, then your social dynamic is going to be stronger. So this is the connection that I thought was most uh, uh, significant of the way people assess a policy. Mm -hmm. and especially the policy that protects your salary because it, it frees up your time. To, to tutor, to volunteer with the wider community. And that's what, what, what has, done, uh, has been done. Do you have any more questions? I have, uh, yes, thank yeah, you. Uh, a question that is, uh, you may or may not have uh, explored. Uh, uh, and I'm curious because I did some work with IDPs in northern Uganda, uh, Acholis, which is a very different population <laughs> than the one you studied. And one of the things that surprised me is the lack of community. That is, the fact that they were not uh, Cohesive. Uh, connected with others and doing, trying to do things for the collective among them. They were used to have other people from outside to do things for them, and they were very, very passive. Uh, uh, I wanted to see well, you, what is your own, not bias, but impression with these two uh, communities that you studied in regard to the, their own interconnectedness or the sense of collective? Actually, I was very surprised in my interviews with the host community. I thought that being under the, under the globe of this uh, universal umbrella of Indian Hindus, that the local communities would be more forthcoming. Uh, the first response, uh, and, and uh, we, we, we are the same group of people. But when the uh, host community told me they, we didn't really have much to do with, the, with these people who came because they had their own NGOs who took care of them. So we didn't really have anything to do with them and uh, we didn't really influence any policy. But at the same time, they are telling me that we did approach our leaders to evict them because we were not able to use our resources, our community wedding hall, because it's, it's to house the, house the IDPs. So although they don't talk directly, they don't bother the IDPs directly, but they approach their leader. So, uh, so I was surprised that uh, um, we still have parallel society. 
of IDPs and hosts, and I was surprised of the of the of uh, uh, very little uh, connection between the host and IDP. We and within within the IDPs uh, and in the two co in the two communities, which was really my question. Your sense is that they have a sense of collective, and they have. Uh, one for uh, one for you, and one for all, and all for one, etc., etc. Or that they are dispersed, and each and each one his own. IDPs, you mean <coughs> the, the mentality of the, the IDP as a cohesive IDP group? As a, in the in the two groups, IDPs are very divided. They are very divided. They are very fragmented. They are very fragmented in many ways. Um, uh, first, you know, the policy is different for both groups in Jammu and, and in Delhi. One has been given free accommodations and one has been given subsidized where you have to pay and take a loan from the Delhi government to, to rent the property and so on. So, uh, so I think what the policy has done is uh, actually have fragmented these two communities. And even within them, on the issue of return, people are fragmented. They're either they, they want to go back uh, and uh, or they say that well, we have lost our right to, for for our homeland and you know, this this was a esteemed place for birth as well as death. The government has denied us of my right to die in my land. So uh, and then there are people who say, well, I, I just cannot position myself to go back to this humiliating place. I just cannot trust them. So there is there is a divergence of, of the views and also in the two two groups uh, in Jammu. 100% of the people, they don't want to go back. In Delhi, 40%. They told me that they want to go back, but only 7% said, we will go back without shoes tomorrow. Uh, but only 40% are telling me that we will go back provided we get a separate homeland conditions. So uh, the community is divided. A community is divided, in, and the policy context has a lot to do. Because the policy of keeping them in settlements versus in the outskirts has influenced their decision to return, which is the key decision in the displacement community. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Now go open the question. Uh, hello, so thank Hi. you so much for this. Uh, it was very interesting thank uh, you. presentation. Actually, the, the question I had is very much related to uh, to Dr. Fluski's comments. I'm going to pick by on, on, on that. Uh, Maybe it's a basic question, but I'm not very familiar with the context. So, do have these people been granted political rights? So, do they do they have the right to vote either in local elections or like in national elections or something? Well, they are residents of Jammu and Kashmir, which is a separate state, which is uh -huh. a state within the sovereign India. They have a right to vote in Jammu and Kashmir elections, but not in the elections of Delhi government. So they can't form political parties to advocate for, for themselves? No, they, they have NGOs who are fighting for separate homeland, and, but, but no political party. But the fact is, being away from your home, you have lost a lot of, a lot of rights, participation. I mean, if you're not there and the, and, the, and the survey person comes and knocks at your door 10 times and you don't answer because you're not there, you are taken off the register of voters, so you lose that right to vote. So there are issues like that. So yeah, they, they are no, they haven't formed a political party, but uh, um, so the only way they, to advocate for themselves is through the NGOs. Through the NGOs, through the NGOs, and, and NGOs have proliferated since the uh, since the advent of this displacement. So uh, the NGOs actually have done quite a bit as far as you know. They, there has been evolution in the housing. They started with the makeshift tents, and now they are in the apartment. And they say that it was the work of the NGOs uh, that really moved us from, you know, one tiny room to building now. Uh, so uh, yeah, through the NGOs are, are the face, are the, are the voice of the people. They have gone up to the Supreme Court. NGOs, uh, the umbrella organization called the All India Kashmiri Samaj, they went to the Supreme Court in Delhi. To, to fight for the labeling of these people. They say that uh, these people are not migrants. You have to call them IDPs, because as IDPs, they have different rights. So they, they are fighting on the behalf of the Kashmiri Pandits. So, so NGOs, yeah, All India, this uh, umbrella organization does uh, represent them. And the related question I have is that you said that in New Delhi, uh, IDP populations are dispersed, whereas in Jammu, they are concentrated, concentrated in one, into one, two. 
So I don't know, I mean, I don't know whether you noticed the difference, but was there any difference between how active these people were uh, in terms of uh, how they advocate for themselves in Jammu, where they live all together, vis a vis, uh, uh, sorry, uh, as opposed to, um, to New Delhi, where they are dispersed? In Delhi, yeah, they are dispersed. They are all over the place in Delhi. In the mainstream, some of them are in the mainstream, but some of them are still in the camps, which which are their own group. So, um, and they they are all advocating through their own NGOs. But as far as uh, people in Jammu are concerned, because they are now living in the separate community, which is called a mini township, which is really meant to protect them from the very distance, you know. So it's like a mini township, uh, army controlled area. Uh, uh, they don't feel the need to uh, to advocate too much as the as the people in, in Delhi because they they think that the people in Jammu got free accommodations and free this and that and if the government was on our side we would have moved out of the camps by now they are saying so they they do uh, yeah keep their their NGOs alive to to fight for them. Congratulations, thank you. It's a very interesting presentation, oh, very interesting you. discussion. I was hoping you might be able to um, talk a little bit more about the reaction of the host community, sort of going off of some of the questions that uh, Professor Kostelin and Professor Alfred have talked about. Um, I was really intrigued by your term of houselessness mm -hmm. and that um, and the relative deprivation and perceptions of the host communities, you've noted, given that so many of the IDPs of the Kashmir pundits who are not interested in going back, and the division of the policies of that are being played at the policy level, what is the host's community side on all of this in the sense of um, how are they viewing the others as if they are going to be uh, permanent, that they're no longer migrants per se, but they are IDPs, but they are going to be permanent IDPs. Um, they are concerned about your saying about the intermarriages and, and the concerns like that. What are the kinds of concerns that the host community is having about these other communities for long term situations? And what are the conflicts that are arising currently? And if the IDPs attain permanent status in those communities, what kinds of conflicts do you see arising between the host community and the IDP uh, newer community? Well, this has to do with the position that the officials have placed this. They, they, if they call it as migration. Migration means you are here to stay. That you are not forced out is not a temporary disturbance and people... Migration means you, you of own, own volition, sought new opportunities. When the IDPs listen to that narrative of the policy maker, they have an immediate reaction and they say, well, if these are migrants, let's classify them as migrants. Let's make uh, the inclusion and exclusion, who can be included in our community services and who will be out. So as soon as you hear the word that you have a community of migrants, obviously you start this hierarchy of rules and regulations, what will govern, what kind of jobs they will get, what will be what social services they are allowed to get in my community because I my children they have to pass the college entry exam to be entered into a good college but the migrants just because in the based on the status of the migrant they have been exempted from the college entrance and they get admitted why because they, they are migrants so this is the kind of tension that that occurs if they can really kick them out if they're migrant stop the policies. This is what's happening. Uh, one uh, family told me that um, they kicked us out of Delhi, Bapudham camp. And he's saying, the, the father, uh, he told me, he says, it's very ironic that they kicked us out and they told their political leader that because they, we want to kick them out because we, we can't use the wedding hall for our purpose because it's, it's housed by the IDPs. He's saying, Sudha, it's very ironic. This community hall we vacated 16 years ago and it's been locked up. It has never been used. There was no urgency. It was not warranted that that they wanted to kick us out. And the government, the Delhi government, kicked them out. Made settlements in the suburbs, and the hall has never been used. It's locked up. I went to see the hall, and the uh, the 
uh, the manager, he didn't open the hall for me. I said, this, is this where people used to stay when they came to Delhi? He said, yes. I said, can I see the rooms? He said, no, 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 we, we are keeping it locked up. I want to see what kind of room it is. But the, the room is not, the hall is not being used. So this is the tension, overcrowding. And as people say that, the host says that, you know, before these people came, we were a very peaceful community. We, uh, we don't cheat. We are very educated people. And these people, they have come and crossed on our rights. Uh, you know, they, they came and they, they, they are uh, uh, really polluting. Uh, uh, and and they, they uh, double dip in the compensation, which is not really a good thing. Our children watch and, and it's not good. So this is what they're saying, uh, uh, that social tensions are there and they will continue. And that's why you have this uh, separation of community with the stereotypical images of the other, you know, suspecting the other of doing wrong. And that, that will continue until uh, uh, there is no, no winning situation <laughs> here, you know. So. Which is my follow-up question, if I may, which is what kinds of policies or conflict resolution mechanisms are available for the host country in order to address some of these down the line? Well, now that I have, uh, I have, I'm handing this model, nested model of internal displacement to the conflict resolution community with all the issues uh, nicely put into this model. This is my contribution to the CR. What CR can do now, knowing the issues and the connectedness, uh, connectedness of issues, they can start building some kind of a relational empathy model to knowing what the host perceives, the IDP to do, and so on. So this, this model is a diagnostic tool to analyze problems of similarly displaced communities and take the model, take my model, and, and uh, build a relational empathy uh, uh, scheme to, to uh, intervene, uh, to guide uh, the host and the IDP. This is, this is what I think the CR can do now, uh, now that I uh, put everything in a, in a frame, so. Can I ask you a question, uh, if I may? Yeah. Uh, uh, for the construction, for the social construction of the other, especially the, of the evil other, or the uh, streaky other, or the uh, what a cheating other, it's always useful that they, they are somehow, they come uh, carry some mark marker, no? Uh, the letter A or mm. whatever. Uh, if I would be in the street in any of those places, could I differentiate people who are uh, originally from Kashmir than the, from the locals in any way? Not from the physical attributes, you can't. And clothing or well, the accent? Pe people or? in Jammu, the people in, in Delhi, um, <laughs> because they don't want to be targeted. They, they want to mix in. So they have adopted a, a, a hybrid of their dress style. You can <coughs> see less people, few, fewer people wearing Kashmiri embroidered dresses with long earrings, which are a trademark of the married ladies in Kashmir. As soon as I interviewed uh, uh, one lady and, and came to learn that this is a hallmark, when another uh, visitor came to their house in the evening, I knew that she's also from Kashmir. And this is a hallmark. But, but people fear being targeted. And so they're losing their physical attributes as well as their preferences for things. When I, I, I went to uh, one family's home, they, they, their food looked just as, as it would in a, in a person who is a daddy resident. They, they, there is no difference. Uh, their language may be a little bit different right now, but, but they are picking up uh, or, or maybe losing their, their language and culture. Uh, they, their practices have changed, they have modified, they have toned down their, their rituals that they used to do. Uh, uh, so uh, you, you can't really tell by walking on the street uh, that uh, uh, you are a polluter or, or uh, the, uh, you are the one diluting my culture. Shocks. Yes, Shocks. We, sh we should have, we should have, uh, yes, we should, we we should, should have, have markers. Yeah, marker, marker. Yes. Um, Otherwise, the create community, at least on the part, on the part of the IDPs. Uh, yeah, because this if is not if the IDPs dilute instead of having clear markers, they will never politicize and create a, a, a collective. One well, very interesting thing uh, that the Jammu family that I stayed with, uh, she told me, she said when we used to go and uh, to shopping in the Jammu street, uh, people used to look at us, uh, the, the locals. 
because we, we wear our, we brought our gold jewelry and we have long earrings. And they used to look at us and they became very jealous of us. First we are fair people because we came from the mountains and these people are dark skinned. So they became very jealous and they became jealous of our gold jewelry. Uh, so uh, so uh, the, the mother, she told me, but, but, but uh, we had to wear our jewelry because the government gave us very small apartment. It was not safe for me to leave my jewelry. So when we went in Jammu street, I had to dress up. I had to wear everything. But now, uh, but now I, I see her, she's not wearing the gold jewelry uh, because they have a two, two bedroom apartment. So things are changing. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. I mean, it's not, I don't know if it's a good thing or because you are losing culture. You are losing a, a community. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, uh, no markers, but uh, people are integrating this global community. Uh. Okay. Uh, Kavitima, do, do you want to make some comments, some observations, and the process, how she conducted research? And we came to decisions that we now have new PhD. 